considering everything that's happened recently with South Carolina and players entering the portal, there's been a lot of negative talk around NIL. But NIL could be the big reason why one Gamecock remains with the team in 2023. I'll discuss why and more today right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free today. Terms and conditions do apply. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Lyon, and as always, thank you for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen here today. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. And we have got a lot to unpack on this Monday edition of Locked On Gamecocks. We're going to talk about how one particular factor could play a big role in Spencer Rattler's impending decision on whether or not he'll come back to South Carolina in 2023. We'll talk about some of the big commitments that happened on Sunday afternoon and evening at the end of such a big recruiting weekend for Shane Beamer and the football program. And we'll dive into some comments that Lamont Paris made about his basketball team after the Gamecocks fell to East Carolina in the Greenville Invitational back on Saturday. That's going to be the roadmap for today's show. So let's go ahead and get on right into it with Spencer Rattler and NIL. Because look, we've talked about this already on this show. There is no question that these days in college football, for a good faction of players, NIL is going to play a significant role into their decision of whether or not they're going to stick with a particular school. Obviously, depending on how you feel regarding a couple players, this may have already affected South Carolina in a negative way with some of the guys they've seen enter the portal in the last couple of weeks or so. But of course, South Carolina is not the only program that is facing this issue, that is having to deal with NIL being basically leveraged as a way to get certain players to go into the portal. There's plenty of other programs out there that have seen some of their star players walk out the door because they felt like that they had a chance to really capitalize on some massive NIL opportunities. But what we do need to address, what we do need to acknowledge at least, if we're going to talk about all of that, is how NIL has helped South Carolina. And one big example of this has been Spencer Rattler. Now, obviously, NIL was not the main reason that Spencer Rattler came to South Carolina. It was mainly the coaching relationship that he had with Shane Beamer and the trust that he had in that Shane Beamer was building a program here at South Carolina, that he was going to bring enough talent in order to really help Spencer Rattler elevate his draft stock once again to levels that he had seen before his sophomore season unfold over at Oklahoma. Now, What we're going to discuss is how NIL could affect Spencer Rattler's decision to come back to South Carolina in 2023, because we have to think about, in terms of money, how that could compare to a potential NFL draft contract that Spencer Rattler could receive if he chose to go pro. And the thing is, in the NFL, when it comes to these draft contracts, a lot of the money and how much is guaranteed to a player is dependent on where they end up getting drafted. And with prospects who could go pro, of course, they always receive a draft grade from a specific committee from the NFL. And according to an article that was written by the Post and Courier's David Kloniker a while back, he had a conversation with multiple NFL draft scouts and basically asked them, you know, how would they grade Spencer Rattler? And when asking all three of these scouts that question, two of them gave real specific answers. So basically said that Rattler would be viewed in their eyes at best as a late day two draft pick, meaning 
probably late third round pick, to a day three pick, basically rounds four through seven. And the main thing that they pointed to was his inconsistency. They all acknowledged that there's no question Spencer Rattler's got the talent. And when he's able to channel that talent and not be sort of reckless, I guess, with the football, he's one of the best quarterbacks out there on the field. But that's their main concern. Can he learn to harness it on a consistent basis and put up performances like he did against Tennessee and Clemson? And I have to be honest, when reading the responses from these draft scouts, it leads me to believe that even if Spencer Rattler went out there in the Gator Bowl against Notre Dame on December 30th and absolutely balled out. It probably would not change their opinions very much. So if you're someone who really wants to see Spencer Rattler come back, which is probably every single one of you, if you're someone who believes that he needs to come back, this is music to your ears right here. Now, of course, if Spencer Rattler could be a late day two draft pick or a day three draft pick, what does this mean regarding how much money he could see in the NFL compared to what he might be making right now in college? In order to get a better idea of this entire scenario, I went and checked out both what his NIL value is deemed to be according to on three and subsequently what the signing bonuses were for quarterbacks that were drafted late in the third round or in the fourth round in general from the 2022 NFL draft. So let's start off with on three's NIL valuation. Now, now to make something crystal clear, this is by no means an accurate number of what Spencer Rattler is actually making at this moment in time. It's just purely an estimation based on his recent performances on the field, and also his social media following, and maybe another factor or two that's thrown into the equation. But according to On3's NIL valuation, Rattler's estimates be worth $884,000 based on all the factors that I just mentioned. So obviously, pretty good payday for someone who is a 21, 22-year-old college quarterback. Now, moving on from his NIL valuation, let's talk about NFL draft contracts and talk about where he could be drafted and the subsequent value at those slots. Now, the thing about NFL draft contracts that is important to consider here, outside of first round draft picks, besides a player's initial signing bonus, once they sign the contract with their NFL team, not much of anything in the contract is guaranteed. Now, of course, there could be particular instances where you do not see that take place. Maybe if there's a second or third round pick that the team used to be an absolute steal, maybe there is a little bit more guaranteed money on the table compared to some other guys that are drafted both before and after that particular player. But those instances are admittedly few and far in between. So for a player that is in the NFL draft, the selection slot is extremely important. And according to a website called Spotrack, where they track the data of all of the players that were selected in the previous few NFL drafts and their subsequent draft value and signing bonus. In the 2022 NFL draft, the following third and fourth round selections made these amounts in signing bonus. Let's start off with Malik Willis, who was the 86th pick in the 2022 NFL draft, basically drafted in the third round, late. His signing bonus was $932,800. If we're going to take Spencer Rattler's NIL valuation number that we threw out earlier and say that is exactly what he's making right now, that would be a little bit more, but not a ton more, needless to say. Matt Corral was the 94th overall pick in the 2022 NFL draft and was also drafted later in the third round. Matt Corral, his signing bonus, according to Spotrack.com, was $884,904. So right there, you're already seeing almost a $50,000 drop-off, and he was selected just eight spots behind Malik Willis. So that gives you an idea as to just how important the slot selection is here. Now, Bailey Zappi was the only other player that really falls into the mix here with this scenario. He was drafted with the 137th overall selection, which was late in the fourth round of the previous NFL draft. And Bailey Zappi's signing bonus, according to Spotrack.com, was $647,072. If you do the math on that real quick, that is almost $300,000 less than Malik Willis and almost $250,000 less than what Matt Corral was given in his signing bonus. So again, it is a massive numbers game here in terms of where guys are being drafted. So to move on from all those players, and to get back to the topic at hand, which is 
How could this affect Spencer Rattler and his potential decision? How could he view this? Well, here's the thing. Spencer Rattler could decide that he's going to bet on himself. He, he could say that he's put enough stuff on film to where he is worthy of being a day two draft pick. And he goes on ahead and he goes into the NFL draft pool. So let's say he joins the NFL on a mostly non-guaranteed contract outside of that signing bonus that he gets. That means that Spencer Rattler would have to play another two or three seasons in the NFL against some of the best football players on the planet before he would have a real chance to get a new contract where he would have to be hopeful that he's in a good situation with good players around him, a good coaching staff above him, and good management who will be aggressive in trying to bring in some good players around him. And at the same time, he would have to try to get through over 30, maybe even 40 semi games unscathed when it comes to injuries. That obviously is a lot of dominoes that Spencer Rattler would need to fall in his direction in order to see this come to fruition. So the flip side of the coin would be Spencer Rattler could come back. He could make the same amount of money, likely more in NIL, at South Carolina than he would if he were to get drafted in the late third round or fourth round where some of these draft scouts have him slotted at right now. He could try to elevate his draft stock for the 2024 NFL draft. It would probably be a pool of quarterbacks that maybe wouldn't be viewed as highly, admittedly, as the 2023 class. And therefore, he would have a chance to cash in and make more money in both situations at South Carolina and going into the NFL. So the choice based on NIL and everything seems clear for Spencer Rattler, but obviously, as we've talked about before, it's Spencer Rattler's final decision here. But it is a very intriguing facet in this entire situation and one that deserves a really close look when we're discussing what all could play a role into Spencer Rattler's final decision in this process. But that's something for a few weeks down the road because South Carolina has got a lot going on in the present moment on the recruiting front. They're, of course, making a big push for Lenore Sellers, who's still currently committed to Syracuse as of this current moment in time. They also got four commitments on Sunday to cap off a big recruiting weekend. And some of these guys are going to play a big role for this team in 2023. Who were those commitments and what do they bring to the field? We're going to dive into all of that in just a few moments, right here on Locked On Gamecocks. But before we touch on all of those prospects, I do want to let y'all know that today's show is brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn. Now, Shane Beamer, much like a manager, is looking for people who are going to be able to help his organization or small business both in the current moment and in the future. Shane Beamer, of course, is bringing in multiple transfers once again, like he did for the past two years, because these are guys that are proven. These are guys that are qualified. These are guys that he trusts can come in here and fulfill the role that they're going to be given. And when you're a small business owner, you want the same thing for the people that you hire for your operation. And the thing is, you can do that by using LinkedIn Jobs, where you can create a job post in minutes to reach both your own personal network and the worldwide professional network that consists of over 800 million people. You can also add your job to the purple hashtag hiring frame on your profile, which helps to find the right people that fit the job description to a T because it uses tools like screening questions to filter through candidates and populate viable choices and the right team member to help you finish out the year strong. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus other leading competitors in the industry because LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free today. Terms and conditions still apply. Welcome back to this Monday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. I want to thank y'all once again for making Locked On Gamecocks your first watch or listen here today. For your next watch or listen, I would like for you to go check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, where the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day all take place. The Locked On Sports Today podcast is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Now let's talk some recruiting for South Carolina 
football. Now, South Carolina had multiple commitments that they got on Sunday, and I'm going to dive into all those players in just a second. But first, a quick update on a really important target that's still on the board right now for the Gamecocks in South Florence quarterback Lenora Sellers, a player that many Gamecock fans, especially those within the state, would love to see wearing the Guardian Black in 2023. But they are in an absolute dogfight right now against Syracuse a team that has had the pledge of Lenora Sellers since earlier this year, like back in the springtime. So this is a recruitment that's going to come all the way down to the wire. And Lenora Sellers was asked by News 19's Reggie Anderson on Saturday after the Shrine Bowl about his commitment status to the Syracuse Orange. How strong is it? And Lenora Sellers gave quite the intriguing response when asked that question. Right now, your Syracuse commit is that still? I mean, yeah, but you know, some stuff to think about with that. So, needless to say, it doesn't sound like that is an absolute done deal that Syracuse is going to get the signature of Lenora Sellers. And this is evidenced by the efforts that the coaching staff of South Carolina has put up. As according to Sports Talk Media Network's Phil Kornblut, Lenora Sellers talked with several Gamecock coaches via cell and text on Saturday, but he also was communicating with Syracuse during the week. Apparently, he is going to sign on Wednesday morning, which is the first day of the early signing day period, but he's going to wait to announce his decision up until Friday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And apparently, he also put the strength of his Syracuse commitment at between a 6 or a 7 at this point. Look, there's no question that Lenora Sellers' connection with Jason Beck, the new offensive coordinator now for Syracuse, has been strong this entire process. But South Carolina is making a big pitch here. Listen, you could stay home. You could become beloved here at South Carolina. You could become the next great quarterback here. You got all the tools and intangibles that we look for in a quarterback. We got a guy that was just in the NFL for over a decade now as our offensive coordinator. He's going to get you right if you come to Columbia. So it'll be interesting to see how that recruitment shapes up over the coming days. Now, the Gamecocks also did nab four commitments on Sunday. And the first one was Florida transfer tight end Nick Elksness. Now, admittedly, Nick did not play a whole bunch at Florida the past two seasons. He was mainly a special teams player. So in order to get a better idea of what kind of player he could be at South Carolina, I had to go all the way back to his 2019 junior high school film. So admittedly, some of these things may not be completely applicable. He might be a much better player now than he was three years ago. At least we would have to assume that. But this is what I had to go off of. So... Nick can line up in the slot, he can line up outside the numbers, and he can also line up in line with the offensive line. He's not someone that basically is going to be stationary at one spot on the field. He's also a very good route runner for a guy that is a tight end. He's your quintessential modern-day receiving tight end. He's a guy that can go out there and run you some routes and is really good at catching the football as well. He's great at high-pointing it with his hand-eye coordination that he possesses, and in terms of run blocking, he is a willing run blocker. He's not afraid to go get in there and get after somebody. He understands the importance of hand placement, especially when he is a part of a run blocking play. So Nick Elks just brings a little bit of everything to the position at tight end. And while I don't know if he might be maybe a starter as soon as he comes to South Carolina, he is certainly someone that could be some really good depth here, play some significant special team snaps to start and really sort of learn the nuances of this offense that Dow Loggins is going to implement here in Columbia. Now the Gamecocks also landed transfer running back Mario Anderson Jr. from Division II Newberry College in South Carolina. Mario Anderson might have brought the most excitement, honestly, out of all these commitments because obviously he's a South Carolina kid. He admitted that he cried a little bit after he found out that South Carolina offered him this past weekend. And uh, Mario Anderson, listen, do not let the fact that he played a Division II school fool you. This is a kid that could bring a significant impact to South Carolina. He is a north-south runner. This is not a running back that tries to juke and jive everyone that he comes across. He pretty much is going to maybe make one cut during a play and otherwise run straight down the field. He's got some good speed, but he really mixes that in with some great ball carrier vision and some solid short 
field agility, which makes him a threat to create explosive play on every given play that he touches the football. He's also a very strong back who keeps his legs moving. I mean, the guy rushed for over 1,500 yards and had 19 touchdowns in 2022 and was named a Division II first-team All-American by the Associated Press. So Mario Anderson could very well be 2023's version of Antoine Wells Jr. And with the losses South Carolina has had at the running back position recently and are going to suffer in just a couple of weeks, they desperately need to find a guy like Mario Anderson. And it seems that the Gamecocks have gotten someone who could indeed be that bell cow for them in 2023. Now, to go back to the player who was the second commit for the Gamecocks on Sunday, the Gamecocks also landed Pennsylvania native Ty Sean Russell. Now, Ty Sean Russell admittedly was a guy that did not have a whole lot of offers at this point. He was, of course, offered by South Carolina, and his only other offers that were recorded by recruiting service websites were Virginia Tech, Central Michigan, and Maine. But listen, do not let the offer list fool you. Tyshawn Russell is a guy that can make some big-time plays, especially on offense. He played both sides of the ball at Bishop McDevitt High School up in Pennsylvania. And when watching his highlights, there's a multitude of things that he does offensively. He's got good speed, and he gets faster as a play progresses. He's a fluid route runner. He's got good ball carrier vision after the catch. He is extremely light of foot, which probably propels pretty much everything in his athletic toolbox at the receiver spot. He is the kind of receiver that you want to get out in space. You do not want to send him to just basically go on a hitch route and just sit there for majority of the play. This is a guy that is essentially perfect for today's game. Someone that you have constantly moving and you try to get him in open space. You let him have an opportunity to go make a play after he gets the football. Tyshawn Russell fits the bill perfectly there. He's got great hand-eye coordination that he uses to track the football when it is flying towards him, and he is also a willing run blocker, a trait that you see out of a lot of players that Shane Beamer and the staff offer on the offensive side of the ball. Guys that are not afraid to get after somebody when it comes to the running game. Now, the Gamecocks also landed a big-time transfer from the Ivy League ranks, and we're going to dive into that commitment, plus Lamont Paris made some... Uh, Interesting comments, to say the least, about his team's effort against East Carolina on Saturday. But before we go through all of that, I do want to also let y'all know that today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Bet Online, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional league and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer and esports. Bet Online has got it all. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix in. So head over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more because Bet Online is where the game starts. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. The last commitment that the Gamecocks got on Sunday evening was center Nick Gargiulo from Yale College. Now, Nick was a guy that played left tackle originally when he enrolled into Yale's football program. He played 14 games at left tackle in 2019 and 2021. Of course, the team did not play in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic where the Ivy League canceled pretty much the entire football season. But Nick Gargiulo really made progression on the field this past season that just ended. He was named a team captain for Yale in 2022, which is considered to be a huge honor when it comes to the Bulldogs football program. And he started all 10 games for the Bulldogs once again, but this time he started at the center position. And he did so well this past season that he was named a unanimous first team all Ivy League selection. And I don't have really any film that I was able to use to get a good idea of what Nick Gargiulo is going to be bringing to the gridiron here at South Carolina. But needless to say, just based off of the resume alone, 
This is a guy that is going to slide right on in at the center position for the South Carolina Gamecocks. Of course, they're losing Eric Douglas after the Gator Bowl because Eric will officially have graduated and completely exhausted all of his eligibility that he has left at this point in his college football career. So big pickup here for the Gamecocks with Nick Ardrillo. Do not mistake that as anything less. Nick is going to play a very vital role for this offense and will be somebody that Spencer Rattler if he comes back, of course, is going to have to get to know quite well for the 2023 season. Now, unfortunately, it was not all peaches and cream for South Carolina this past weekend. The Gamecocks did take the hardwood on Saturday on the men's basketball side of things against East Carolina in the first ever Greenville Invitational. It was a really cool tournament between a bunch of South Carolina and North Carolina-based schools. But um, South Carolina just did not play a good basketball game, really. I mean, they came back in the second half and made it look a lot closer as they only lost the game 64-56. to But the Gamecocks were down 19 points at halftime, and they had only scored 18 points total in the first half. Their halftime deficit was bigger than the total amount of points that they scored in the first 20 minutes which was less than a point per minute. Those are not stats that any head basketball coach ever wants to see pop up for their team. And Lamont Paris, needless to say, was not happy with his team after this performance and what has been a string of lackluster performances. Here's what he had to say regarding the team's competitiveness overall. We're not, we're not a great team right now. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm making any sort of crazy assessment by saying that we have to we have to get better and some of those ways are basketball ways but some of those ways don't don't have near as much to do with basketball I mean, we got guys have to compete better I just uh, it's foreign to me we, we have some guys that don't compete um, the way that I would expect you to compete as as well in tiddlywinks honestly but certainly as a division one basketball player on a consistent basis that would be the one thing that I would expect uh, uh, to be constant. So we'll get there eventually. So as you can tell right there, Lamont Paris not thrilled with his basketball team right now. Clearly, he wants some of these guys to really dig deep within themselves and see if they are somebody that really wants to help this basketball team out, somebody that really cares about winning and losing, it seems like at least based on what he said. So... A lot of people are going to probably sit there and say that there's a bevy of issues with this basketball team, plain and simple, and admittedly, that is the case. There's definitely a multitude of problems here that the Gamecocks have got to fix. But in terms of what I think the main issue is right now for Lamont Paris and this team, I don't think the guys have learned yet how to play in this offense. And look, we talked about this before, Lamont Paris basically runs a free reign type of offense where he has some set plays, but for the most part, he lets his players go out there and he pretty much allows them to decide what kind of decisions that they want to make in terms of what kind of shots they take, who needs to shoot the basketball, you know, all that good stuff. He pretty much calls some sets just to try to open up the door for some opportunities for them to make those decisions in the first place. But it just seems like a lot of the times that the team is just not really confident overall, that there's very few players that are willing to just sort of take the bull by the horn, so to speak. And I think part of that leads back to the fact that there isn't a whole lot of proven major conference experience on this team. Hayden Brown is really the only player who's proven himself over a decent stretch of time at the collegiate level, at the Division I level. But the thing is, Hayden Brown was doing that in the Southern Conference. So even he's going through a learning curve right now. Hayden Brown is facing some tougher teams now in just the non-conference slate for South Carolina than he did when he was with the Bulldogs of Citadel. And the thing is, I just feel like that there's sometimes some possessions where guys are making too many extra passes. Guys are almost too hesitant, too afraid to go out there and just, you know, take their shot. And look... I know that when it comes to basketball, I could sit there and say that one day, but then a few days later, they could play another game and we could sit here. We could be saying, you know, South Carolina took way too many bad shots today. It was like they didn't have any patience. And obviously I'm not in those shoes. 
So I'm not someone who would completely understand just how difficult it is to find that happy medium between being aggressive, but also knowing when to hold off on a certain possession, or knowing when to kick the ball out to someone else on the court and let them decide. The issue is, again, it seems like there's too many players that lean more towards that conservative side of them on the court. And honestly, right now, the one player, maybe two players that I could say that are not afraid to shoot the basketball consistently are Gigi Jackson and Michi Johnson. And that's not maybe the greatest thing for South Carolina because the thing is, obviously, you don't want to just have two players that have enough confidence to consistently shoot the basketball. But secondly, Michi Johnson, he's been dealing with a bunch of lower body injuries already this season. So you don't want him to feel like that he's got to carry the load pretty much the entire time he's out there on the court. Because obviously that could lead to more serious injuries. And for Gigi Jackson, you know, Gigi, look, we all know he is extremely talented. He's one of the most talented basketball players to play for South Carolina in a very long time. He is going to be here for one year. He will be a lottery pick more than likely in the NBA draft this coming summer. But you cannot be leaning on an 18-year-old kid to be the offense for this team. Hayden Brown, I think, needs to take more of the onus offensively. I think that there needs to be more times where he gets the ball, and as much as I know that Hayden Brown probably wants to try to get the, everyone else involved on offense, he just needs to take the ball and just decide, you know what, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to go up with the basketball here. So there needs to be a few more guys on this team that just needs to, when they get the ball, just take it and go, honestly. Just don't even think, just play faster and If this team does that more, especially early on in these games, while still, again, trying to, of course, facilitate some and help each other out in terms of getting some open looks, then this team, in my opinion, would be more successful. But right now, it just seems like they're having an issue finding that kind of rhythm. And because of that, you see games like this one against East Carolina, where they go down big in the first half. And despite how great they played in the second half, because they really did, they played a phenomenal second half, both sides of the floor won the second half. But that doesn't matter when you lose the first half as badly as you did on Saturday. So this team's got a lot of growing pains that's going through right now. And they've they've really got to figure this thing out pretty soon and in a hurry because conference play is getting ready to start up in just a couple of weeks. And if this team is still having the same issues that they are having right now then, then it's going to be uh, even worse for this team. And it'll make the conference slate much more tougher than it's already going to be. So with that being said, y'all, that's going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope that y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show. As always, what are your thoughts on NIL and how it could help the Gamecocks keep Spencer Rattler for the 2023 season? What are your thoughts on the four commitments that the Gamecocks got this past weekend? Who are you the most excited about the Gamecocks getting? And lastly, if you watched the game on Saturday or the last few games, from the Mott Paris's basketball team. What do you think the biggest problem is with the team right now? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube or shoot me a message at a line underscore SC on Twitter. I'll try to respond to it as quickly as I see it. And once again, don't forget to make Locked On Sports today your second listen or watch now that you have watched or listened to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But Once again, y'all, that does it for me on today's show. Hope that y'all have a great rest of your Monday and a good start to the work week. And I'll catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.